I wanted to start with a story from many years ago. It, it goes back maybe more than 40 years ago when I first joined my father's business. Uh, it was much smaller than it is today, and I was given a suitcase full of samples and told to go and see customers all over the place, all the reaches of the country, to sell, including Tobago. And on this particular occasion, I was sent to Tobago to see one of my dad's very close friends. They were close friends because he respected him. He respected him because, like himself, like my dad, this man started with nothing. And like my father, was making his way in the world and honoring his commitments and being very straightforward in his dealings. His name was Rufus Phillips. He was a famous Tobagonian businessman. And I was given the task of going over to show him all of the new fabric that we had just received. So I arrived in Tobago, and outside his store was a banner that said, Phillips Conscience Sale. This is more than 40 years ago. I was 20 some odd years old. That's enough detail about my age. And I looked at the banner with a bit of confusion. And then I went inside to say hello to Mr. Phillips. And he said, sit down here. And he took me behind his wrapping counter because he was busy. Conscience Sale was working. So I sat behind the counter. And what would happen would be the customers would come to the counter and they would put something on the counter and they would pay what their conscience said to pay. This is the explanation he gave me. So a lady came to the counter and she had a dress length. She said, Mr. Rufus, I'm paying $10 for that. So he took the money, put it in a bag and he gave it to her and she left. A gentleman came to the counter with a toaster. He said, Mr. Rufus, I'm paying $15 or I'm paying $20 for that. Rufus took the money and put it in the bag and gave it to him. A man came to the counter with a hammer, a Stanley hammer, and he put it on the counter. He said, Mr. Rufus, I paid a dollar for that. And Mr. Rufus picked up the hammer, got up from his chair, and attempted to hit the man. <laughs> so I said, Mr. Rufus, what are you doing? It's a conscience sale. Mr. Rufus said, that man have no conscience. <laughs> so it dawned on me all those years ago it hadn't dawned on me before that there are people with no conscience. I had always assumed that everyone had a conscience, that everyone cared about each other and would do the right thing. But Rufus taught me a valuable lesson, which you learn when you are a self-made person. Like my dad and like Mr. Rufus Phillips, you learn the lessons. And one of them is that not everybody has a conscience. And how does that connect us to a responsible elite. Because the silence of the elite is meant to say that we are being unresponsible. Unresponsible is a term coined by Lloyd Best, a famous citizen of our country who all of you should know. We have to decide if we want to be responsible about those who may not have the means that we have. And the two components of being responsible, in my humble opinion, are conscience, which I have spoken enough about now, and the other part is common sense. And the common sense aspect of us being responsible to those, and I'm speaking about a responsible elite, not about those who are better than anybody else, but those who have more means those who occupy the corridors of power, those who cut ribbons with ministers, those people that are silent. What I'm saying is that they should be vociferous because they have a conscience, but also because they are sensible, because they should recognize that they should water the tree from which they pick their fruit. They should recognize that they should nurture and prune the tree under which they shelter they should recognize that it can't be that the ship of state will sail smoothly if everyone doesn't have basic amenities, if some live in splendor on the top deck and some people are below deck with little ventilation and little convenience and little service. It is going to upset the equilibrium of the ship. 
And it has done it throughout history. It is not a novel idea that I bring to you. So the concept is that we should be responsible if we don't have a conscience. We should be responsible because it is sensible to be responsible to those who do not have the means that we have. And why am I raising this complaint? Well, if the business community complains about union behavior, it has no effect. Union people assume that that is our role. If union people complain about the business people, they pay very little mind to the complaint. But if a union leader was to complain about the behavior of workers, and a businessman was to complain about business people, wouldn't that be a little bit more convincing in your opinion? Yeah. And where does that philosophy about complaining about your own come from? It's not my idea. That is the philosophy of the great Mahatma. Gandhi believed that to resolve the conflict between the Hindus and the Muslims at their time of independence, he should complain about the behavior of the Hindus of which he was one. And that is how they didn't go into civil war. I mean, it didn't end up as happily as it should have, because tragically he was assassinated. But that also is the philosophy of Mandela. Mandela had a truth and reconciliation after the release from 20-some years in prison. He didn't come out and blame his captors. He came out and asked them to explain themselves and to admit what wrong they had done. So it is my view that I have the right and that I should raise this complaint. So what is my complaint? My complaint is not about the disparity between you having a car and those of lesser means having to take the bus. My complaint is that you have a car and the bus never comes for them. That's my complaint. My complaint is not that you can go to a private hospital and get attention and those of lesser means have to go to public health care facilities. My problem, my complaint is that when they go to the public health care facilities, they sometimes sit there for 10 hours and no doctor attends to them. That is my complaint. I am not saying, I am not saying that you are not entitled to enjoy the fruits of your labor. I am saying that we have to guarantee some basic amenity of service to ordinary people, to people of lesser means, if we want to live a harmonious and productive life and if we want our country to develop. So, what is the cause of this inability of the bus to arrive? What was the reason for that? So how do we respond since our post-colonial days to that problem? We buy more buses. How we deal with the problem of the patient sitting in emergency, waiting and no doctor coming and being told at five o'clock in the afternoon the doctor going home. How we deal with that? We build more hospitals. And how do we deal with an absentee rate among teachers? that exceeds 30 and 40%, how we deal with that, we hire more teachers. And what has that done? It hasn't worked. So what should a responsible elite do? Donate the buses, pay for the teachers, import more doctors, that doesn't work. So what is really the problem? The problem, in my humble opinion, is that we have to admit, we have to accept that it is not going to get better. We have to accept that. We have to accept it because we know it, because we have the education to analyze it, because we know that the diagnosis of it is not that we don't have enough buses, but that we don't know how to guarantee that the buses will run. That is our problem. We have bought billions of dollars worth of buses and ferries and everything else, and we still can't get the service to operate. Why is that? I'll tell you why. This is where I'm trying to be responsible now. In addition to asking you to be responsible, this is my act of responsibility. To say that it's not going to get better, and the reason for that is as follows. At Independence, we took the British Charter of the Constitution 
and we drafted our constitution. What does the British Charter say? The British Charter says that man is an honorable creature. We took the charter of our colonial masters and said that it was a document that we could build on. And that document prescribes that man is honorable. It's an old world document. Go back and see when it was created. I mean, centuries ago. Almost a thousand years, maybe. What did the Americans do? They were a colony, too. They wrote a new constitution. Did they take that charter? No. They wrote a brand new constitution. What did it make the assumption about man? It made the assumption that man is a selfish creature. He can be honorable, but he's prone to tyranny. The word tyranny exists in the American Constitution several times. They were trying to make sure that they never faced the tyranny of a colonial master again, and that their own government couldn't turn into a colonial master. So they wrote a new constitution that separates their president from their parliament. And unlike the British, they do not appoint their senators, they elect them. They elect their congressmen and their senators. Their members of parliament and their senators are both elected. We appoint our senators. And to prove my point, we have a majority appointed by the government of the day, a minority appointed by the opposition, and then we have 11 independent senators appointed by Her Excellency the President who are supposed to guard the public's interest. So my question to you is this. If those 11 are supposed to guard public interest, who are the others guarding? <laughs> well, the answer is clear. They are guarding their party. They are guarding the party. And is it their fault that they're doing that? No. That's what the model requires. So let me give you a quick example. When Mr. Obama brought his health care package to the United States people of universal health care, insurance for everybody, it had to be remodeled and changed. It had to be amended. Who amended it? Who caused it to be amended? Mr. Obama was a Democrat. It wasn't the Republicans that caused him to amend it. It was the Democrats, because they came to him and they said, listen, chief, if I go back to my small town where they elected me, and I cause those small business people to pay all of those charges, they will never elect me again. So unfortunately, you aren't going to get my back in unless you make the following changes. That is how government works. You can't have a prime minister deciding that we are going to build this or break down that, and every member of the cabinet, instead of seeking his constituents' interest, seeks the interest of the Prime Minister. So in that regard, Kirk Megu, who I sat on a committee with, was a professor at UE, he often used to say to me, we replaced our English governor with a local governor. And that is my thesis. And therefore, it is responsible of me to say to you that if we want to see change, if we want to see the quality of life improved, if you want to be responsible, either because you have a conscience or because you are sensible, or you are both, we need to set about writing a new constitution. This is my recommendation. In the United States, the model that they created that is afraid of tyranny has had the effect of enriching the power of ordinary people. And that's why for many years, I think it was Mr. Truman, President Truman, that had to put a plaque on his desk that said, the buck stops here. In our societies, the buck stops with the previous government or the other party. That's what we see when the public complains we never say, it was my fault. I should have made sure the drains were clear so the highway wouldn't flood and people waited for hours. We never say that. It was the system's fault, a former attorney general said, about three babies that died in two weeks at the San Fernando Hospital. The system is bad. How could the system be bad? Who is the nurse that ignored the child? Who is, it? Is, is that nurse and doctor still there? Do you even know? So let me say this. 
How many more years, 500 murders a year do you want? How many more flooding events do you want after every 30 minutes of rain? How many more times do you want to be stranded trying to get to Tobago? How many times do you want to pay more for a ticket to St. Lucia than you do to Miami? How many more times does this have to happen before you realize? Before you realize that we need a new rule book, I would like to say to you that the spirit of conscience is that we do not enjoy eating a great meal if those below decks are without anything to eat. That is conscience. And it is common sense if we're eating a great meal to recognize that the meal will be threatened if those below decks have nothing to eat. You decide. You want to do it because of your conscience. You want to do it because of common sense. You decide. But my plea to you is, speak up. Do not be silent. And let us please get set about, not to asking for a new constitution, let us write one among us. And I thank you very much for the opportunity of expanding my idea about the silence of the elite. I hope I have been convincing in some, to some extent, and I thank you very much for the opportunity.